by ear. So for those of you who want formal, perfect, safe structure, forget it. Just don't bang your head. <laughs> don't bang the head? Yeah, yeah, you're close. <laughs> oh, I've been close to head banging for a long time. All right. How many folks do we have? God knows. All right. Well, I certainly won't be remembering all your names, so forgive me, but we will be writing them down. Um, let us see. Do we have something to write them in? Yeah, yes, we have all oh, kinds of papers. There's a list over here. Okay. Right. And Maybe there are a lot of people that haven't signed it that well, don't read tonight. We're just starting up, so... Everyone who reads, we will be asking you to sign. So we have in your, anywhere. your names. Oh, God, it feels like a bad Colbert show. So I'd be your host tonight. I'd be Bobby Burgess back from some island. God knows. Uh, many of you have been here. Oh, I'm getting a prompt. <laughs> this woman holding the book is the one who knows everything. Yeah. She is the usual moderator who just couldn't take all the crazies here anymore and has left and has asked me to fill in. But that is the official book. This, this is the book. Can, Chuck, can you put that on the table or something? Um, that's just kind of a keepsake for later. Each. If you feel like writing month, something page, in... So whether you're reading or not, just sign it if you want and add notes if you want, whatever you want to do. Um, it's Name. just a nice little thing. Okay. How much money do you want for your form? This is if you want. Uh, you can read somebody else. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Let's see, take it. Sit down, Bob. I don't know how long I can take it. For all you folks who've been here before, welcome again. And you see we got many new faces, so who knows? For all of you who are new, welcome. Is everybody signed? Who wants to read? This is no, you know, if... If and when you want to read versus just listen, we'll ask you to sign your name. And one of the main reasons why is we have the fortune or misfortune, depending on how you feel about it, to be recorded for posterity. Uh, this will go on Woodstock Community Television. Be nice to Rachel if you'd like to make you look good. Uh, it also gets she looks good everyway. If she'd like to make <laughs> you look good. And this, what is it? this goes on YouTube too. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in seeing what you look like or you're not, those are the places to go to or avoid, depending on your whim. Uh, so she will be recording everybody who reads. And so when you read, please give me or Rachel your name or sign it. And uh, so she'll get the name right when we see it. Uh, I see a lot of faces here I've never seen before, which is great. Um, everything here is very supportive just beyond saying it. In other words... Everyone who comes up here, we are going to give a round of applause to, right off the bat. So it feels good, and you know you're wanted, and you can read whatever you like. It can be your own poems, it can be anyone else's you like, it can be something different altogether, whatever you want to do. Uh, when we have a group this big, we may have a time limit. So everyone has a chance to read. Are we still? About 10 minutes most. Yeah. Give or take, we'll work it out. Uh, what else? Am I forgetting anything that all of you good committee people know is 
crucially important. We usually take a break in the middle. And when the groups are very small, we will usually not. But winter, of our discontent, etc. aside, this be one of the best populated groups I've seen. So we will certainly take a break somewhere. Um, there's water, restrooms around. Uh, let me see if I think I missed anything crucial. Um, beyond whatever I think up or forget, as I said before, Danelle, who has been running this for a long time, will fill in on anything I've missed. I think it's good so far. Give it time. I'll let you know. I'm sure you will. <laughs> it's a lot of subtext here among, among the ones who come all the time. Uh, oh, and again, anyone is welcome to come and just listen. There's no pressure. If you feel like reading, fine. If you don't, fine. This should be fun. Can't legislate that stuff, though. So I got some, I think I've said, so once more into the breach, it says here. Let the fun and games begin, order in the court. How you all doing tonight? I don't think we have to go through any of that crap, do we? Okay. So, okay. Ah, this is important. For any of you who would like to come back and find this fun to listen or whatever, we do meet. Most of the time, once every month, the first Tuesday at 5.30, and it goes to about 7.30. Pretty much every month there are occasions when it doesn't happen. And it's usually here in the library, often in the other room. What else? Blah, 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 blah. Um, hmm. But it's a, a pretty loose platform. If people feel like singing, they sing. Whatever you feel like. So I just want to see if I forgot anything that is supposedly important. Um, certainly with a group this size, I'm going to be reading last. So as everyone has a chance to go, uh, my stuff is usually so god-awful depressing. Anyway, I don't want to drive people out before we get there. So, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. you know how to see yourself on the community television if you want. I think it's usually Channel 8, something like that. As far as order, anything you want. Whoever would like to go first, fine. Otherwise, I can pick people arbitrarily. Generally, I'll tell you, just for a change in voice, if we have enough people, men and women, we like to alternate. Does anyone have any special requests of, I want to go first, or I don't want to go, or anything, or we will just go on our own? Any thoughts? Chuck smiles. I don't have any thoughts. Is there a relation <laughs> between the smile and the thought? <laughs> Is anyone dying to get up here? Get it over? Oh! Oh! Good. Oh my God, somebody raised their hand. What the hell am I going to do? Megan! Meg. Is it Megan or is it Meg? It's Margaret Mary Elizabeth. Oh, that's too much for me. <laughs> Margaret Murray Elizabeth? Meg. Meg. So, you have, we have the sheet just as a model, but maybe we ought to do that. Um, since that already has some names on it, I actually brought. Well, instead of figuring it out for Rachel, there's a list of presenters here. Um, so signs when they come up. Yeah. So if you well, that's too much. We I'll I'll take care of it. We will, but somewhere make sure we have your name in the order. So the first one's going to be Meg. We'll work it out later. Okay. Can we give a hand to Meg, please? Hi, 
I need my hat because it's a cold chill. Why not? So, I recently got, um, I was asked by a couple of really old friends from, you know, you, you keep doing, or I, at this point I start doing this all the time where I'm like, from like 20 years ago, and then I'm like, oh no, that's 35, 40 years ago. <laughs> anyway, they're, they're, a, they're a lot older than I realized, <laughs> these old friends. And um, uh, at any rate, one of the friends asked, sent out a thing saying, you know, I want to do a little uh, share a poem thing with people, friends and strangers, and I hope you'll pass this along. However, just about everybody I sent it to through email saw this as some sort of Ponzi scheme yeah. and some sort of outrage, even though every day they're on the internet entering their email to win some contest or buy something. And I'm like, Jesus, we're just looking for a little poem here. So anyway, I, I did, uh, so I sent one, this poem, to somebody, the first person who was on my list, because I knew he'd like it, and I hadn't heard, really been in touch with him more or less in 40 years, except when his brother died. So, um, so this was when we all lived in a place in San Francisco that we called the Nirvana Hotel, which was not a hotel, it was someone's house. <laughs> And um, we got in a lot of trouble there. But one of the things we did was we went to a lot of poetry readings. And um, not surprisingly, we read a lot of Charles Bukowski. So, um, but when I read this poem again, I was like, I thought this was like stuff that I would have liked in my 20s and maybe in my 30s or 40s. But I was like, this is so apt now that I'm approaching 70. So anyway, it's called Roll the Dice by Charles Bukowski. If you're going to try, go all the way. Otherwise, don't even start. If you're going to try, go all the way. This could mean losing girlfriends, wives, relatives, jobs, and maybe even your mind. It could mean not eating for three or four days. It could mean freezing on a park bench. It could mean jail. It could mean derision, mockery, isolation. Isolation is the gift. All the others are a test of your endurance, of how much you really want to do it. And you'll do it, despite rejection and the worst odds. And it will be better than anything else you can imagine. If you're going to try, go all the way. There is no other feeling like that. You will be alone with the gods, and the nights will flame with fire. Do it. Do it, do it, all the way. You will ride life straight to perfect laughter. It's the only good fight there is. So then, I didn't hear back from anybody I sent a poem to. It was like 19 people. I was like, fuck you guys. Oops, sorry. Camera. Anyway, finally I got something from the main person I sent this to. So I was very happy. So he wrote, Meg, I love this poem. Yes, Charles is the man. I remember hearing him at a high school gym in San Francisco. Gary Snyder had also read in that gym. Holy shit, that was 45 years ago. We are scattered all over the US now. So then that made me think of Gary Snyder. So I looked up a little, quick little Gary Snyder poem. If I can find it. Which may mean more to me than to you, but. He's the old beatnik boys, Rick. Yeah, all the, all the beatnik guys. Or they weren't all guys, but it was kind of a guy scene. And I eventually, a number of years later, read a poem at a, at a poetry reading with a beer in my hand, and I felt such, like such a poet. I was like, <laughs> swig and then read, read some bad poem that I'd written, um, which I will do in the future. I will read some of the bad poems I've written and other things, but tonight I'm just going to read these. Um, so this is called uh, Point Reyes, which uh, some of you may know in San Francisco. It's north of the, um, that, big, that big bridge out there, the Golden Gate Bridge, and it's, um, and it's on the ocean, and it's, um, it's very pretty. Point Reyes, 
sandpipers at the margin in the moon, bright fan of the flat creek, on dark sand, rock boom beyond, the work of centuries and wars, a car is parked a mile above where the dirt road ends. In naked, gritty sand, eye-stinging, salty driftwood, campfire smoke out far, it all begins again. Sandpipers chasing the shiny surf in the moonlight by a fire at the beach. Thank you. Someone like to go next? I'll go next. And Danelle Sims. So I memorized a poem this month. <laughs> Thank you. I don't do that very often. She told me I didn't have to memorize anymore. Yeah. Um, and I was just going to do the one, but then I came across this sweet little collection of poems written by Miriam Canaday. And um, I want to read a couple of these. These are from the first half of the 20th century. Um, this one is from 1937, and this is a book of sonnets <coughs> that her children and grandchildren put together. Lone in deep winter stands the ancient tree, moon etched on snow while o'erhead glittering, wheel Orion and the wane. It does not feel nor hold of summer's past a memory. And yet that old deep core of roots must be sentient. Conscious, waiting to unseal the latent life and bud and leaf reveal in that vast numbness brooding silently. Does not the rising sap, spring stirred, bring pain with life back to these tingling boughs again? In what surprise the old tree sees its head with these bewildering blossoms garlanded. So waking in my heart, the thought of you stirs summer long forgot in me anew. And this one also has trees in it. You took the summer with you when you went away from me. I think the garden knew this was the end of flowers, the last of blue of sky, of summer's leafy lavishment. In Requiem, the wind made harsh lament strewing with snow the roses dead birds flew adown the blast shrilling a swift adieu and my heart wept for all that you had meant i had not known even from their symphonies of song how many a secret lovely nest the summer's birds had built amid the trees till the leaves fell i had not really guessed all that you had wrought in me till you were gone and through my lonely branches winter shone so that's well, yeah, I mean, I assume that that is the North Pomfret Kennedy. It is, yes. The the grandmother to the folks living there now. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Would it be Ward Kennedy's <coughs> wife? Probably. Lydia's grandmother. Yes. Grandmother. Lydia's grandmother. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 So, yeah. And this was put together, but yeah. So um, let's see, do I need to do another one or should I just do the other thing? Whatever you feel like. Uh, I don't know. They, like, they're all awesome, but... Um, Do one more. It must be they remember the spring trees, last autumn's glowing colors that they wore, for maples leaf out scarlet as before. There's reminiscent purple tinge in these new oak buds. April aspens on the breeze shake thin, new, tinkling castanets once more golden as those in last October's score of the deep forest's color symphonies. Only the loyal pines steadfast recall summer's own pure and immemorial green. A hundred fickle springs, though they have seen, theirs are the longest memories of all. So does my heart keep green amid its rue, the one eternal memory of you. Um, they're not all about trees. I just happened to pick those. <laughs> There's all sorts of stuff in there. And then um, the one that I think I memorized 
by Angela Jackson called The Scarf. Babies you must take care with, the soft spot in the middle of the head. Hold them just so, like cradling a, pre a precious vase, mouth open to contain mysteries, the grains of the remains of a loved ancestor. Some women, some men, you must take care with. We, oh, sorry. Some women, some men, you must take care with. We are easily misled. It's the soft spot in the middle of the head. Dreamers, <laughs> give us a hint, a subtlety, a half-spoken promise, and we weave a bliss that floats out of that soft spot in the middle of the head. Believe me, I will never change. I will always be a baby who smiles during a dream. My skull tender as a veil, a scrim between one world and another. Now I float a dream like, like a question in a comic book, hoping for a hand to hold it. Strong and works hard, an honest heart. Believe me, I know the difference between ignorance and bliss. A dream grows up and protects the soft spot in the middle of the head. A lie dies. It wants to live, but there is nothing it has to give. All of this knowing has come from having been misled. Before I began wearing all day and to bed a scrutinizing scarf over the soft spot in the middle of my heart and another over my head. There you go. Um, I've been here a while. I've been doing this poetry thing kind of since it started. I've been around the edges of it. I'm going to be going away for a little while. I'm going to go to Virginia to stay with my folks for, I'm not exactly sure how long, maybe half a year to help them for a while because they're, they need me. And then I will be back maybe summer-ish somewhere, something, but. So you'll have a whole book of poems when you come back. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll try to have one memorized by the time I come back. <laughs> Thank no, I mean, you. Right, so. Oh no, I haven't done that yet. Yeah. And on it's... Thursday we're having a little party. Oh in the yeah, afternoon. Thursday afternoon, come by and say bye to Nell and get some food if you want. No, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How about a male voice for variety? Is it Mark? Mark Bowen. This is going to be pretty short, I think. Um, I'm going to start off reading a John Berryman poem. Um, Berryman is someone who I always turn to when I'm sort of lingering as I try to write. Um, he's tragic, he's funny, he's profound, all in a turn. Um, also, one of the hardest things I think as a poet to do um, is create a title for your poems. And he had it down with his dream songs by just numbering them. So this is Dream Song 14. Life, friends, is boring. We must not say so. After all, the sky flashes, the great sea yearns. We ourselves flash and yearn. And moreover, my mother told me as a boy, repeatedly, ever to confess you're bored means you have no inner resources. I conclude now, I have no inner resources because I am heavy bored. Peoples bore me. Literature bores me especially great literature. Henry bores me with his plights and gripes as bad as Achilles, who love people and valiant art, which bores me. And the tranquil hill and gin look like a drag, and somehow a dog has taken itself and its tail considerably away into mountains or seas or sky, leaving, me be leaving behind me wag. 
All right, I'm going to read um, actually some of my more recent poems that I've been working on since I moved into this area. Um, which I'm going to start with two older ones. Um, the first is called The Mythology of Non-Existent Places. One can only look at a sky like this and think that the last question has finally been asked. Or at the very least, the questioner has drowned too slowly in its relentless color just as he opened his mouth for that task. Either way, it's this sky that causes the mind to turn to the pause that follows, and how blue that silence sounds looking down on us. Each open completely to it, while we wait dumbly for it to say something that can only come from the heavens with a voice that's wider even than any direction any of us is willing to go. Projection. A lamp stands in the corner like a man caught up in his own awkwardness and spooks me with his outbursting glare of judgment. The brightness of its collar calling me out. I tell myself that I'm safe from its brassy recriminations, that this kitschy centerpiece of long ago garage sales is held quiet by the soft tones of the walls lit up behind it. The windows opposite staring apathetically back through eyes made by the reflection of its own light. Yet I know that this lamp, ugly as it is with its overdone outrage, has, done, has a right to some suspicion and to wonder why I am sitting here in this almost empty room on a box of someone else's packed things with no intention of ever getting up, of ever leaving. All right, these two poems are um, poems I've written within the last few months. Um, first one is Early Morning, Somewhere in Vermont. This morning begins with a violence of light rising from below the horizon and an afflicted song coming clean from somewhere be unseen in the woods behind me. A multitude of small voices joined in a chorus sounding like a host of souls made up of the excommunicated dead. An unholy choir of frogs gathered by the, uh, by the thousands in the shallow suffering of a dying creek bed. It's beautiful in its way and frightening. The way that despite how much this sunrise reminds someone of seeing a bright explosion early one morning on some distant shore, that it is still beautiful. The high hat dissonance belted by these tiny anuras makes me think that there's something I must be at fault for. And also the distant mistakes that for so long have kept me suspended in a state of continuous fear. Each frog knows its part in the damage it does. The melody is full of the judgment behind me and it plays thick in my ears. It is a plague on my heart coming from a thousand amphibious throats. The sun has now taken a position better suited to focusing on me, this daily inconsolate glare. The frogs have receded into their swampy depths, leaving me in this unwelcome silence and my own recriminations. I wonder if there was a silence accompanying that bright flash one early morning on some faraway shore, or if those who were there to witness it also heard a music that sounded something like the one that was just here. Something to give you a little taste for the depressing stuff that Bob will read later on. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Um, all right, this one is um, not so depressing. Um, and, you know, in writing this, it sort of made me think, you know, my mentor in grad school often would qu say a quote where she would tell us to tell the truth even if it's a lie. And it just seems like a really confounding statement. And then you know, and kind of on reflection of this poem, it made me realize that, you know, in a lot of our poems, they're, they're fiction. But there's an underlying truth underneath that fiction. That's us. That's ourselves. That's a piece of us. 
Um, and even though I set out for this poem to be a story that I'm telling, <laughs> it's actually a story about myself that's just kind of opaque. And, um, obviously won't be real clear to the reader, which I think is a good thing, because then you can sort of come to your own conclusions. But there is a clear meaning in there, which I kind of like. So it's called A Life in Pictures. The history of my life has been turned into a series of dramatic photographs, imaginative black and white stills of the highlights and pitfalls of my personal existence so far, as seen through the pale, undiscriminating eyes of another. My own memories of what I've lived through have become as dim and unreliable as the present is for someone suffering through dementia. And my hope leans on the thoughtfulness of a truth-driven stranger and his cold instrument that the sum of who I was matches the beauty and timelessness of these photos. My life is on display in a closed down gallery along a once extolled alleyway in a darker side of town. The sum of who I'd been Oh, whoops. There are those, sorry, there are those who would find this a heartbreaking position to be in, as though it's some sort of strange life support for someone no one remembers. But I'm okay here, people. It's quiet in my life for a change and I'm enjoying the solitude. The picture lights are all lit up and they illuminate the reminders of my successes and failures with a soft yellow apology in this otherwise dark room. The purgatorial atmosphere of the place is evidence that I am neither in heaven or in hell, which is to say that I am still alive. I have not lost myself in these carefully rendered photographs of me in their various blends of gray, with their thought-provoking perspectives that cause viewers to reconsider impulsive judgments. My life in pictures is far from over. This series is an incomplete representation of who I will have been. My hope is a prayer that when the time comes, the next artist, now still young in his craft, will have the same love of life and of art as the last, and the desire to capture in still life as beautifully as he can everything that I had, since now, tried to accomplish. Thank you. feels like it. What about our young friend here? Do you feel like it or would you like to wait a little? I don't have anything. So you want to just listen? Yeah. Terrific. Wonderful. How about you, Peck? Since you've mm -hmm. volunteered someone else. Uh, okay, <laughs> sure. Okay. Peg Brighton. <laughs> I thought I would start out with um, an ode to Thanksgiving. So. <clears throat> Here's to another bountiful buzzing, cranberry-dazed, epicurean fantasy feast, gravy-flavored happiness. How intensely this jumble of kin and kids lingers around the table, munching nuts, ooing pecan pies, questing for remnants of roast stuffed turkey under the plate, vanquishing vestiges of want, extinguishing your full zest. Zzz. This is an alphabet poem. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, such toys. Well, what can you do? Try to keep the mind going. <clears throat> um, several of us uh, in a poetry workshop have been talking about ekphrastic poetry, which is a response to artwork, often visual art. <clears throat> and our discussion brought to mind a memorable trip for me to the British Museum. I don't know about you, but growing up as a kid, I never thought I would ever go to Europe or, I mean, going to the supermarket or maybe the ballet would be the maximum. Anyway, marble fragments, Parthenon remnants at the British Museum. A long ago shadow hangs over the room. All of this was stolen, lost, saved from ruin. Once through the entrance, impossible not to be swept into endless shades of white, 
carved flowing manes, chiseled riders pressing fierce heels into stirrups, hands clutching proud necks of horses whose beauty shocks, stuns me strangely to tears. Dazed, I am surrounded with the heaving flanks, pounding hooves of horses, cries of urgent riders, clouds of ancient dust rise around us. Beyond the walls, stone fragments carry me into their long lost world. Nearby in an alcove, a calm presence commands. Floating marble draperies define divinity, how a woman beyond beautiful moves in heavenly winds. Headless, limbless though she is, her essence fills this room with living gesture. She keeps on giving us the gift of the past. Um, for local color, if you know the Tigo store, you'll know what inspired this in Pomfret, the old general store. Old windows at the Tigo general store. These fly spec windows invite shafts of light to fall onto inner walls where weathered wallpaper of swans or roses is worn smooth to the touch. Relics within, frozen in time past, Sit on the edge of the bed, kick off shoes, rest aching backs, lie back for a stolen nap. The old windows frame homely views. They let us look out on the world, comfort us at noons and midnights, uncounted times between. It is all framed within and without by the views we take in, by the weather inside and outside that blows through the cracks. One more? Why not? Yeah. Okay. No. Winter's arrival. My car wheel sh windshield is frosted this morning. The ground is frozen hard. Beside the walkway, the rhododendrons... Sorry, I'm going to start over again. These glasses are terrible. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Winter's arrival. My car's windshield is frosted this morning. The ground is frozen hard. Beside the walkway, the rhododendron leaves curl up tight, clenched against the blast. Down the road stomps cold man winter. He comes in fury, snapping frozen twigs, breaking icicles off tree branches with his stick. Around him swirls a storm of his own making. I pull my coat tighter around me, bracing myself for what's to come. The desolate darkness, the chill, the silence of falling snow. Thank you. Oh, so, because I didn't use much of my time, just want to tell you that this Sunday um, at the North Chapel, there will be a special tribute to Mary Oliver in poetry and dance at 10 o'clock, free, open to the public. When is it again? 10 o'clock, Sunday morning, Sunday. at the North Chapel. We hope you'll come, and for better or worse, some familiar faces you see tonight may show up. How many people here are, are still wanting, are reading versus listening? So I just get a feel for when, who wants, who's reading? Five of us. Five. Okay, Five. so. How many have we had already? Oh, four. So we'll Why take, we have one more we'll take a break, break and, and we'll have one more then take a break. Peter's ready to read, right? I, you better listen to him because he's running the show. <laughs> Peter Fox Smith. I've brought three poems, one short, one medium, and one a little longer. First one is called Gift from the Gods, subtitled Bell's Palsy. I'm under the affliction of Bell's Palsy right now, which is a disease that is 100% non-infectious, so I can't give you anything. 
It is a disease for which there is no known reason why you get it, and it is a disease for which there is no known cure. One third of the people that get it never get cured. Two thirds of them get cured by Bell's palsy itself within four or five months. I will do the best I can to make myself understood because those that know me, it's perfectly obvious with half of my face paralyzed that I am not speaking normally. Bell's palsy. Just one of God's gifts to me. At 18, God's gave me Bell's palsy on the left side of my face. Eventually, it went away. But in another gracious gift, God's brought it back to the right side of my face. And now that I am 84, and this time it is not yet going away, my eye won't blink, my mouth droops, my right jaw is swollen, quite sore, and it is hard to put food in my mouth, and even harder to chew. And because doctors know it is better not to fuck with gods, there's not a goddamn thing they do. My second poem will probably sound to you like prose, but it is clearly poetry in the sense that it is composed of 28 couplets, each couplet having eight syllables in the first line and three syllables in the second line. It's entitled Girls and Boys. Football is a fierce game for the fast strong, tough. And now even girls play football on a team. Cause girls like to do what boys do. Box, pole vault, wrestle, compose, operas, drink, make money, make love. However, one exception comes to mind. More men are nudists than women, and that's sad. <laughs> At least in arch-conservative USA. We all live in a body. Few are perfect. So what's the problem, ladies? You don't have dangling or erect gentle genitals to make you fret. So why all the relu reluctance to duff duds? You never are more free, more in harmony with nature than a nude plunge in the ocean lying naked beneath the warm sun on sand, or walking with the wind on a woodland trail in the buff. Animal among animals, Mother Nature's child, nonchalant, blithe, lax, sprung. But not all girls want to be like boys. Some want to be boys. And there are some boys desiring to be girls. Thus, convoluted chromosomes, X and Y complications 
on which I pass, and say, I cannot wait to watch girls football, girls block, tackle, pass, catch, kick, run to the house, celebrate TDs, field goals, sacks, a pick six, to see a blitz where a girl decks the QB. Finally, are males allowed post-game locker room interviews as more and more we're all the same? Boys and girls, perhaps, becoming obsolete. My last one, for those that have heard me reading here before, know that about 15 years ago, I created a character named Sebastian. He's an Englishman. He got kicked out of Oxford. He sailed around the world all by himself. He likes to be alone. And he lives with the only woman who could possibly stand to live with him. This poem is written in quatrains, stanzas that are four lines each, and it's iambic pentameter, and there's the rhyme between the second and fourth line, all of which says, I am really very old-fashioned to write in meter and rhyme, but I make no apologies for that. The title of the poem is, and remember, this is Sebastian, not Peter Fox Smith. The title is, Sebastian studied Socrates and decided to tell his friends Go home and dispatch the heavy load bending your backs. And under that long title is an epigraph which reads, A human body is composed of seven billion, billion, billion atoms, more or less, depending on how many kilograms. The poem. Someday you may get one of my atoms. Perhaps one of mine came from Bonaparte. Are we made from air, water, and blood? cycling throughout us, pumped by a heart? Our brain's evolution navigates us through what we consider reality, though that which we deem as real is not so. Stymied by limited mentality, knowing not quantum theory, Matter and energy, it seems, does baffle us all. Do we know of what we and Earth are made, having emerged from the sea on a small planet in a moment of time, in a minor galaxy of a cosmos, far beyond our ken, where space and time remain a mystery, where we assume there are 30 billion planets in the Milky Way galaxy, and 100 billion galaxies within the observable universe. Even more, we envision. So, 
here we be, stranded, mere jabbering mortals of 7,000 babel tongues. We toil, fight, invent gods, and worst of all, we make far too many children among too many already. Where bitter hermit me in high hills, pen in hand, attempts to write some purpose into this purposeless world where everything that is wrong is deemed right, where what is ought not be, where what is is out of sync, at least with me, and where doom lurks under each stone behind every tree. But let us not be consumed by such gloom. Death awaits, at times not too patiently. We die some each day, yet in no hurry to transfer our many atoms elsewhere in what's our only immortality. Atoms are forever in galaxies, and here next our home in deep night I stand, a speck, a bunch of atoms fixating on far stars without means to understand how large I seem below those dots of light, how tiny I am within this cosmos, how relative are all things I will leave for scientific aficionados. And sotto voce, sing joys triumphant over all life's petty disparagements, to know the far stars, the sun, moon, planets expand into endless space, vast fragments of a meaningless and mindless matter, totally unaware we come, we go, and when between, in between, breathe every moment in and out, posit meanings while longing so for something to give and to have called love. I hear the night owls screech, wolves howling, I hear winds rattle the last leaves of fall and contemplate what the winter will bring. Snow, cold, ice, a pause or end of some things, yet also a special beauty, a mood much less feisty, turbulent, not so fraught, it is our penultimate quietude. But make no mistake about this. In all space, no gods. In human bodies, no soul. Ultimately alone we are in this cosmic conundrum, digging like a mole. Thus, forced back to gloom. But what can I say? I'm a gadfly, offended by fairy tale beliefs to comfort our fate 
as ill-equipped accidents born to die. Chuck Gunderson. This last time I was here, I mentioned the fact that nothing ever seems to really be finished. And this is an example. This one, this is called Eighth Grade Dance. And I wrote the first few lines of this in the winter of 66, 67. And I wrote the last few lines a couple of years ago. And uh, I wrote some of the lines in the middle about a half hour ago. <laughs> so, eighth grade dance. She danced with the boy who asked her while the other boys too shy pined and drank lemonade while they watched clean in their new shoes and jackets and ties. The young teachers, chaperones talking together, watched her first dance and his. The beautiful girl who was held so tentatively by the boy, with his eyes on the ceiling or the floor or anywhere but on her, while her eyes were patient as if she knew that the awkward, stately, eternal dance, the shadows and antique words that enforce the order that all will fall into sooner or late in fading light and in clinging hope would outlive them all. Teachers and boys would break her heart and all of theirs. This one is, uh, this one I wrote when I was kind of in a happier mood. Um, also quite a while ago, but down, this is called Down Barnegat Bay. Down through the canal and into the bay, a summer day clear and too hot on shore, but perfect out here on the water where we let the boat drift and we watch a fleet of boats off Madaloking, quiet, breathless, becalmed and still. A painting of sails and glassy reflections thwarted by desperate want of a breeze. Two in this boat be calmed as well, be calmed, but here with a purpose, satisfied by no more than being here, only to be here and nothing, nothing more. This one is uh, not by me. It's called a drinking song. Wine comes in at the mouth and love comes in at the eye. That's all we shall know for truth before we grow old and die. I lift my glass to my mouth. I look at you and I sigh. That was written by Yates, William Butler Yates. This one is, this is mine. This was actually published in Vermont Magazine about 10 years ago. It's called Brown's Barn. My barn caved in last night. I don't know if you heard. There's been a few of them come down this winter and I've been worried the past couple weeks with all that snow. I raked down the shed roof best I could, but hell, I ain't near as strong as I was in my prime. In any ways, the roof rake don't barely reach up to just the eaves of the barn. The Brantley boys wanted 300 bucks to shovel it. A lot of money seems to me, but they said it would take two solid days of shoveling with it being all froze up underneath and that new wet snow and all. So I told them I'd think about it. First of all, I hate like hell spending all that money on something that's going to disappear all by itself in another month or so. And money's awful tight. Maybe I was wrong, but I decided to hope for the best. Wasn't nothing in the barn anyway. You remember I sold all the cows at that big auction we had in 92. Cows, milking equipment, gates, stanchions, everything. Kept the tractor, but that's in the calf barn. 
That barn's a lot newer. I helped with the building of it. Me and my dad and granddad just before the war, 1940, I think. Did you know my granddad, T.F. Brown? He's the one built the schoolhouse down by Willis Croft's store. He's the one I was named after. Well, last night when I went into supper, it was snowing hard. More of that heavy, wet snow. The kitchen's kitchen door is right there by the L that connects to the barn, you know. I thought I heard something, or maybe didn't hear nothing, but just sort of felt a kind of a shudder. I looked at the barn. It seemed all right, but I didn't go inside of it. I went into supper, and then Mother and me, we watched the news on TV. She went up to bed, but I stood up a little while longer, and then I went out in the dooryard, and it seemed like the snow wasn't coming down as hard, and I figured, well, if we get by this one, we'll be all right, and I went up to bed. Sometime later, the dog woke me, and there was that shudder again, and then this long, loud screech and a deep groan both together, and I knew she was going. So I got up and went out in the dooryard, and she was already gone. No big crash, nothing but that long groan, and there she was, like a saddle all sagged down in the middle, and the gable ends kind of pulled in toward each other. Those heavy doors had come off of their track, and they was, way, they was leaning out away from the barn against the snowbank. I see them doors like that, and I remembered about Henry Clausen. He was the hired man over to Morton's when I was a boy. Henry was sliding open the door of the barn there, and they figured that the door slid up on some ice that was built up under the eave. And when it slid up on that ice, it lifted right off its track and fell over on poor old Henry. They didn't find him till sometime along after dark the next day. I always hoped it killed him right off. Well, that barn stood over a hundred years, so I guess those old boys built it pretty good. But I wish it could have lasted till after I was gone. I was born right there in the house, you know. That barn's practically the first thing I ever saw. Might be I could sell it to one of them outfits that buys old barns and tears them down. I ain't looked inside of it yet, but I bet there's plenty good beams in it still. And that's what they want, the beams and the barn board. But maybe I'll just let her go and leave her right where she sets. Because she come from here just like me. The lumber come from our land, the hillside across from the house. Great grandfather Lyman logged it and milled it all out, and then him and TF and all the Grangers gathered and had a raising the old fashioned way. So maybe she just ought to stay. Brown's Barn. recently. Um, I've been to Newfoundland up in Canada a couple times in my life. First time was when I was in grad school and I had no money and hitchhiked and it was a low budget trip and I fell in love with the place but I didn't get back again until last year and I wrote this poem about this town, town I stayed in both times called The Granite Coffee House, Woody Point, Newfoundland. I'm guessing that the granite in the cafe's name is related to Newfie pride, or a nod to the long-range mountains rising from the wind-whipped bay beyond. Such cliches and the obvious going down easy with the unexpected foam patterns of my latte. After all, this is a place where winter drums its arctic tune fingers in the rhythm of the stunted black spruce and mats of Tuckamore, reminding all growth to know its place. 
A bitter season that scrapes at the barren plateaus well into May most years and whispering, I'll soon be back. I'm thinking that the name's a nod to great uncles and grandfathers never known, giving advice from the bottom of the inlets where gale whipped snow hid the thin ice and to women pleading in pitch black near headlands, their fading cries swallowed into the wind and crashing waves. It's unplanned knocks on doors, weighed with the heavy stones of harsh news, confusing the odd hours. And it's the cheerful colored facade of chained to bedrock homes, beckoning to heaving fishing boats, too often just out of reach. When I inquire about the cafe's name, I learn though that granite is not the prevalent rock here, not at all. The landscape instead a hodgepodge a puzzle of interlocking, breaking, transforming, accumulating years and ages. The rocks a mix of sedimentary, igneous, metamorphic. It seems that the Bosques, the French, all Europeans who fished these waters over many centuries would lug granite stones from overseas to use as ballast, thus dropping them overboard as the fish were hauled in, so as to keep things in balance to keep all from possibly sinking. I look out onto Bon Bay 35 years since my last trek to this village on the rock, when I knew nothing of lattes, the internet, or what lay at the bottom of the waters beyond, helping to partially frame gross morn in the tablelands, not knowing then of this resting place for so much extra weight that needed to be left behind. I dug this, I wrote this poem back when I was living in Seattle, probably in the early 2000s. And it was, I write about people that I've encountered in life, and this is a woman that I encountered my first semester in college at the University of Colorado way back in the late 70s. And it's called Dreams in Rinse and Hold. It's based on working in a nursing home kitchen. Popping Tylenols to counter middle age aches and regrets, she plops her second week on the job on the plastic trays, squints at the shapes of mush blandly coloring in their compartments, where peas surrender their green to overcooking, mashed potatoes usurp yellow from pats of butter, meat is a brown case of identity theft. She assembles nursing home diet cards affixes names as a side dish to the afterthought of lives. She's minimal in wages and middle age, shoveling trays through the industrial strength dishwasher that rinses her of doubt as to what she's saving up for at age 50. Husband, the maimed course of couch potato, short of words on his disability, except to ferment in pull tabs and reprimands over his wife's slowness with dinner egg cartoning dozens of years, jabbing at her, quote, fat ass, grooming guffaws from their 19-year-old pot fogged and unemployed epithet of son, <coughs> modeling abuse in the red beet pallor of high blood pressure. She's sinking the dinner dishes encrusted with the years, scraping them of dreams of new kitchen appliances, dropping them into the trash her, quote, men never take out, her vision of automatic rinse-cycled evenings circled in the wan ads, no experience necessary for last meals and Alzheimer's. She's pushing her break time to the dry cycle, spilling every regret into a hand-cupped phone, the static of her best friend and stormy winds outside, shaking the windows, rattling a wheelchair against a dining room table, and the office window where her boss prepares to unload what can't be cleaned anymore. Even after a thorough scrubbing, a container burned and warped from which nothing cooked will ever taste good again. One more? Sure. Okay. All right. As I say, I've not read this one before, so it's taking it for a test ride. Uh, 
As I said, people you encounter in life that drift in and out of your, your life. Um, this is called Pinned Beneath Wheels and Open Sky. You pen a random line from a Neil Young ballad. Somewhere on a desert highway, she rides through Pollock blasted terrain, jagged, some might say tortured, by wind and sun. The framing of this Four Corners postcard, and perhaps you're desperate passing through. I shuffle through other, others you've sent over two fitfully exhaled years. There's Chimney Rock pointing and futile, swallowed by a crushing prairie sky, and then the Colorado Rockies heaving, grasping for hands that will shape a future more placid, easing towards some distant sea. Then there's Nebraska's Loop River, twisting a course traced by a drunken finger, pulled by an invisible tilting to a mythical destination somewhere lost in horizon's haze, the waters testing this bank and that row of shedding cottonwoods. The postcards jar as a wintertime shock of hand on metal after scuffing the carpet, or an ambulance's sudden wail while you idle at an ulcering red light, not sure now where to turn, frozen in place. There are no return addresses, no cell phone numbers to dial, only images, hints of journeys back and forth, desperate to escape the hard shadows glued to your figure, burned into asphalt and sand, and these glossy images. Neil has sung of Harley Davidson's and Ohio bleeding, of murderous so-called civilizations raising this hemisphere in some god's name. You bleed of these desperate, of his desperate tonight of nights, packing up silent sets. You stare down from storm clouds at Lilliputian figures scampering underneath, knowing one is you. You are a pine twisted and gnarled by cold winds on a mountain summit, and you're pinned under careening trucks and indifferent probing fingers in some screaming silence. You weigh on an accelerator somewhere now, one hand on the wheel with the last of that Percocet that I no longer needed for pain. Sorry. Rasp in the other hand. Is that it? <laughs> Richard, why don't you go? You mean go out the door or leave? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were my friend. Richard Esty, folks. The first poem I'm going to try to say without looking at my notes. I mean, I say it every day when I'm walking, but you know, when I get up here, I get nervous and forget a line. Uh, it's by Robert Frost, stopping by woods on a snowy evening. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year, he gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there's some mistake. The only other sound is the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. Um, this is a poem I've been trying to memorize, but I gave up, uh, even though I like it. Um, I read them a hundred times, and if I can't begin to memorize them, after I've read them a hundred times, I said, something's wrong. So this is uh, by Gerard Manley Hopkins. As kingfishers catch fire. As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. As tumbled over rim in roundy wells, stones ring. Each tongue, like each tucked string tells, each hung bell's bow swung finds tongue to fling out broad its name. 
Each mortal thing does one thing and the same. Deals out that being indoors, each one dwells. Selves, goes itself, myself it speaks and spells. Crying, what I do is me, for that I came. I say more, the just man justices, keeps grace that keeps all his goings graces, acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is, Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his, to the Father, through the features of men's faces. Um, last month, Chuck read a poem by Thomas Hardy, and um, Peter Fox Smith mentioned how much he liked Thomas Hardy. Um, and I, this past month, I was um, I picked up a new, to me, volume of poetry called New uh, Modern and Contemporary Poetry. It's two volumes, and the first poet is Walt Whitman, second poet is Emily Dickinson, and the third poet is Thomas Hardy. So I read his selections, and this is the one that sort of caught my eye. It's called Afterwards, written in 1917. You have it memorized, Peter? I don't have it memorized, <laughs> but it's one of his greatest poems. Yeah, it, it, it's a cute poem. I like it. When the present has latched its postern behind my tremulous day, and the May month flaps its glad green leaves like wings, delicate film as new spun silk. Will the neighbors say, he was a man who used to notice such things? If it be in the dusk when, like an eyelid soundless blink, the dewfall hawk comes crossing the shades to alight upon the wind-wrapped upland thorn, a gazer may think, to him this must have been a familiar sight. If I pass during some nocturnal blackness, mothy and warm, when the hedgehog travels furtively over the lawn, one may say he strove that such innocent creatures should come to no harm. But he could do little for them, and now he's gone. If when hearing that I have been stilled at last, they stand at the door watching, the full starred heaven that winter sees. Will this thought rise on those who will meet my face no more? He was one who had an eye for such mysteries. And will any say when my bell of quittance is heard in the gloom and a crossing breeze cuts a pause in its outrollings till they swell again as they were a new bell's boom? He hears it not now, but used to notice such things. And then I have a Thanksgiving poem that I actually wrote. It, it, it um, conjures up a memory from long ago, but um, as you'll notice, it didn't come together until like last week. So, <laughs> uh, And it's a Thanksgiving, a little different from Peg's, but uh, it's on the other side of after reading Thomas Hardy, it's supposed to be gloomy, right, Peter? <laughs> and it's called The Lonesome Thanksgiving. I felt as cut off and left out as that tall, lonesome pine, swaying back and forth in that <coughs> wind-racked logging scene. My calls as unanswered as the dangling telephone receiver after the frightened folks fled the house mid-conversation. I enjoyed my time alone in the front seat of the big milk truck that my father drove, which was our only means of motorized transportation. While all the other boys played football in the warm November sun, my time alone in the cab with daydreaming as my familiar playmate. Our large family had gathered at our cousin's for Thanksgiving dinner. Their house was painted white had indoor plumbing and central heat, none of which the house had in which I was growing up in the 1950s. I recall that I ate with three other siblings at a small table for four. Then what a strange thing to do on a warm, sunny Thanksgiving afternoon. 
to go to my first movie in a big dark theater. I felt so alone in that crowd. For years, those lonesome scenes tauntingly played themselves back to me, telling me how lonesome I am in my large family and in a crowded theater. Our cousin, whose parents hosted that Thanksgiving 60 plus years ago, died a few days before Thanksgiving this year at the age of 77. So I asked my nearest sibling if she remembered those Thanksgiving events. She has no recollection, although she's only one year older than I, and she is not senile. This tells me that even in my Thanksgiving memories, I am like that lonesome poem, lonesome pine. Thank you. I gave up memorizing when I entered my own oh, years. I think I'm in my 70s, so I'm having trouble. Jim Ryman. Um, it seems like uh, winter is on everybody's mind tonight, and uh, I selected a couple of poems that have to do with the coming of winter and winter, and uh, have two of my own on the same subject. I am working on some depressing poems. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> These are not... I don't have them tonight. Um, the first one I'd like to read is by David Budbill. Um, many of you know David Budbill, I think, or know of his work. Uh, I was a fan of his poetry and um, had the chance to listen to him re recite his poetry. This is one of my favorites. When I work outdoors all day, every day, as I do now in the fall, getting ready for winter, tearing up the garden, digging potatoes, gathering squash, cutting firewood, making kindling, repairing bridges over the brook, clearing trails in the woods, doing the last of the fall mowing, pruning apple trees, taking down the screens, putting up the storm windows, banking the house, all these things as a preparation for the coming cold. When I am every day, all day, all body, no mind, when I am physically, wholly, completely in this world, with the birds, the deer, the sky, the wind, the trees, when day after day I think of nothing but the next chore, when I go from clearing the woods road to sharpening a chainsaw, to changing the oil in the mower, to stacking wood, when I am all body and no mind, when I am only here and now and nowhere else, then and only then do I see the crippling power of the mind, the curse of thought. And I pause and wonder why I so seldom find this shining moment in the now. The other... Um, Reminiscence on winter and snow is by Patricia Fargnoli, who uh, lives in Walpole, New Hampshire. And this is if you have seen the snow. If you have seen the snow under the lamppost, piled up like a white beaver hat on a picnic table, or somewhere falling slowly into the brook to be swallowed by water, then you have seen the beauty and know it, know it for its transience. And if you have gone out in the snow only for one pleasure of walking barely protected, from the, galaxy, from the galaxies the flakes settle on your parka like dust from just born stars, the cold waking you as if from a long sleeping, then you can understand how, more often than not, that truth is found in silence how the natural world comes to you if you go out to meet it. 
its icy ditches filled with dead weeds, its vacant bird houses and dens full of sleeping. But this is the slow down season held fast by darkness. And if no one comes to keep you company, then keep that watch over your own solitude. And in that stillness, you will learn with your whole body the significance of the cold and the night, which otherwise is always eluding you. And these are my two winter poems. The first one is called The Buddha and the Jay, as observed from my backyard. At the peak of the snowstorm, a jay is perched on the head of Buddha, near the corner of the garden where the dry stems of weathered flocks rattle in the wind. Coal black eyes penetrate the blinding whiteness, contemplating this exact moment and the shape of every exquisite flake that is falling. Fixed in this moment, frozen and motionless in the driving snow, floating upward into the wind and the whiteness, lost in the sky, one blue-gray cloud. And the last one is, uh, um, this is something that I, 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 I've been, uh, it's been with me for a long time because I live high on a hill in a fairly remote section of Bridgewater and uh, I always admire the guys that have to come and plow the snow in the wintertime and uh, how I've become somewhat fixated on the, the, um, the plowman. This is called the plowman. The winter storm rages in the mountains above our home. I wait for the plowman in the dark morning hours between four and five lying awake in bed, waiting, straining to hear in the wind and the snow and the darkness. Then far below and above the rattling wind, wind chimes, I hear the sound of the distant truck straining up the hill a half a mile away. As the plowman nears the top, the engine screams and the plow busts through waves of foamy snow like an icebreaker through a frozen channel, pushing hard, daring not to slow, for stopping is no option. Rumbling past my windows with yellow lights flashing, then slipping into the storm, the lights dim, and the roar of the engine melts into the darkness. At the top of the road, there, deep in the woods, the wind drives the snow furiously. He stops and backs into the turnaround. Before the downhill run in the warm cab illuminated by the yellow dashboard lights, he sits back and opens a thermos of coffee. This is a good place to take a break. I know it well. It's the end of the road. The spruce trees surround the place and hold back the storm. The little brook there runs free all along, along the road, even in the coldest days. Not far from his cab, high above a stone wall, I made a seat of two stones where I go to sit and think on my frequent walks there. I think of him now as he sips his coffee, gazing out into the storm and not far down the hill. I smile before I fall asleep again. <laughs> Heard everybody? Okay. It doesn't mean you can read as long as you want. <laughs> <laughs> so we have some hecklers finally. <laughs> I thought you were alone, Richard, but you brought your people. better half. <laughs> Uh, I promise to keep this um, kind of short. It won't be too sweet. Um, we'll see what happens. Some of it's quite silly. So, 
Why don't we get right to it, right, Meg? If I start sobbing, we know it's... You know, it's pretty bad. So here's a little ditty called Riffing While in Solitary Confinement, also known as some more off-the-cuff nonsense from the doddering old April Fool. So, what is this thing called life? What is this thing called happiness? What is this thing called sorrow? What is this thing called regret? What is this thing called thought, consciousness? What is this thing called human? What is this thing called hunger? What is this thing called lonely, sitting quietly mute in my bones that just waits and wonders sotto voce? Who is the one who is asking if anybody's listening, if anybody's home? If anyone knows anywhere at all, or if in fact there is a where anywhere to wonder why about it all, as it seems to be uncertain if it's really here or there, depending on who's asking. Relativity mostly being much ado about nothing or something about a tree falling. Nobody hears it. So why bother continue talking any further if all you really need to know absolutely one way or the other apparently goes without saying, Meg? Hmm? Duh. So for a little more comic relief, here's a little fairy tale from childhood that some of you may well have heard before, and we'll hear again. I don't know why I'm thinking of you, Richard. Love. Well, we missed each other last month. That's true. In the previous month, I wasn't here either, so it's been two whole months we haven't seen each other. Before. My heart cries. <laughs> so, once upon a time, Long, long ago, when I was very, very young, I thought I'd grow up. Hmm. Be a great big hero, knight in shining armor, conquering the world of my dreams. But something happened along the way. I got lost in the endless day to day until they checked my expiration date, how much shelf life I had left. How the hell did I get this old without even knowing it? was certainly something I intended to postpone till way, way later. Oops. This last one ain't too happy. And it's uh, the first poem I ever got published way back in the 60s when I was still a young lad. Uh, as I look at it now, I see it's quite clumsy, awkward, violent, but I think it may still have some redeeming value, given those chaotic times and the tragic nature of war. Too many people of my generation were far gone, crazy, lost, whatever you want to call it way back then. And this is all I could write down then. Don't ask Give me for any more details, seriously. So call it collateral damage, Vietnam memories, <coughs> dead man walking, PTSD, call it whatever the hell you like. Hell has many different names. It's for John uh, and 
I was going to read this last time, but uh, God got to me too and took me out for a couple of months. But it was really also for Veterans Day, so it's a little late. Thoughts can kill, yet all the killing fields remain. Tight ropes of memory split under the heavy step of some orphaned, who knows how old kid I saw, shivering, shaking, and stumbling around those beyond brutal burial grounds. Kid already with that thousand-yard stare, shell-shocked, numb, bombed-out hair, feet picking their painful path through sharp spokes of soldiers' bones already petrified in stone-cold tears. Long-torn dreams pulled out of their sockets, windows sealed tight in this veteran child's new nursery. Walk among the mountains, walk among the valleys, stagger down the muddy swamps, drown in the flooded, swollen plains. The sound of sorrow is a dead wind, knowing the secrets of old homesteads, chimneys of a life's passage, shuffling feet of a war-torn age, threading their mournful way through this theater of the absurd, framed by endless scarred and blackened sky, whose incinerated morning dawns and dreams lie stillborn, frozen forever in time, splattered across the killing fields of human invention. To witness such horrific nightmares, slaughters of the innocent, slow-walking purgatory, this lost little kid, limping along among the leftover leaves, hobbling alone among the vultures, cocooned in solitary, between being and nothingness leaves no words left do any justice. All that remains is numb, soundless, dirge of enveloping deadly silence encasing my lungs in locked tight shock, suffocating stillness. All that was ever life choked in chains, keening melodies mangled on the bloody burnt-out plains, lost among the leaves, dead among the gasping birds. God, if you're there, help us all. Thanks for listening. Keep coming back, as they say, at the end of any uh, whatever kind of group this is. And uh, let's have a hand of thanks for Rachel for recording all this. <clears throat> Thank you for being here, and let's try again. <laughs>